The True Ambition Podcast with John Zink is brought to you by IT Avalon. IT Avalon, IT staffing and professional services done right. Visit our sponsor at itavalon.com. Now, welcome to True Ambition. All right, welcome to the True Ambition Podcast. My name is John Zink, and uh, I'm here today with a good friend of mine and a neighbor, uh, Chris Donzelli. And uh, he is the founder and CEO of a company called Perfect Star Heating and Air Conditioning. So uh, he lives in Brentwood, California, uh, born in Vallejo, California. Uh, his wife is Christina. Uh, he's got a son named Dylan, a daughter named Ariana, and a beautiful dog named Makita. And sad news, we just lost Bruiser, the yeah. Bruiser boy. Yeah, he was the best. Yeah, he was the best. He was a growly old son of a bitch, but he was a good boy. Um, the, the crappy part about dogs is we end up uh, outliving them most of the time. That was a tough one. So... Uh, you're a big Niners fan. Absolutely. So your season's going a lot better than mine as a Vikings fan. Well, I thought I'd stop watching them after last year, but yeah, they're having a much better season than the purple. Oh yeah, purple socks. So, um, like I said before, we're we're neighbors, and I you're I'm a musician. You're a music guy. I hear music all the time around you, and uh, you like Luke Bryan. Yeah, I like Luke Bryan country. Can't stand him. I know you don't. You don't like him. <laughs> so, um, Luke Bryan, but I do like Rob Thomas, and he's one of your favorites. Yeah, I like Rob Thomas. Matchbox 20. How yeah. could you not like it? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I, I walk out of my house, and uh, it's our second house, and uh, I walk out the front door, and I always hear something. Either it's Dylan playing his uh, workout music out in the garage, or I hear Donzie out back. That, that's... His nickname is Donzie. That's what uh, myself and all of his friends call him. Um, so this guy is a big time family guy. And in our neighborhood, he's the fixer. So I got a story about you before we jump into it. So when uh, Carissa, my wife and I were moving into our house, um, it was, I don't know, maybe we were there a half hour at the most. And uh, in walks Donzie and uh, he's hanging up all of my or our ceiling fans around the whole house. That's right. And then he's in helping put in our uh, dishwasher and dryer. And my wife and his wife had a couple too many glasses of vino mm. and the door got left open and our cat Charlie went outside and my wife starts going crazy on Donzie for letting the cat out. That's right. She oh my like, God. She's going crazy. I'm like, he just put in all of our fans and put it in our dishwasher and dryer. I don't think I let the cat out anyway. Yeah, I don't think he did either. But she could have killed me. <laughs> it was awesome. That that was the intro. And uh, I think part of the story that we're going to get into is what I've noticed about you is you're one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. This guy put in his own pool and his own backyard and the pool is humongous. So how, how deep is that pool? I think the deepest part is nine and a half feet. Yeah, it's huge. And this big grotto, um, a slide coming down the side. It is, it's a big kid's paradise back there. But uh, one of the things I've noticed, we'll talk about his company here in a little bit and how he got where he's at. But the thing I've noticed, the biggest thing about you is you work your ass off all the time, you know, with your company, with your family, with your backyard, with everything. And it's something that I've learned about you from just being a neighbor of yours. And I'm blessed to be a neighbor. So That's thanks good. for being here today. That's all the kudos I'm going to give you. Yeah. And then uh, we're going to get into your story. So uh, we live in a pretty cool neighborhood. Um, my question to you, because we've talked about it before in personal conversations, when you were growing up, did you ever think that you would live in a house like that when you were growing up as a kid? Absolutely not. Never even imagined living in a house like that after where I grew up. You know, I grew up from small beginnings, you might say. So, so you were born in Vallejo. Right. 
And I know you and Carissa had talked before you were in Pacifica for a while, which Carissa was out in Pacifica and her family's out Pacifica, Montana, Half Moon Bay, that area. Mm -hmm. Tell me about uh, as a kid, you guys moved around a bit, right? Right. Yeah. So I came from a, a broken home. You know, my mom and, and dad, they, they split up when I was, I think, six months old or so. Okay. So born in Vallejo, then moved to Fairfield, San Francisco, Daly City, Coma, South City, Pacifica. I mean, we lived at an, in a new place every six months, I would say, for the first good part of my life. Um, even moved to Arizona for a year. So, what part, Phoenix, or where were you at? Well, my grandfather was just outside of Phoenix. Okay, my grandfather had a, a ranch out there. I don't know, river something. Everything's river out there. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm not really sure. I was like five or six. Okay, um, my dad was a San Francisco police officer, and my mom was a UPS driver for uh, UPS in the city. Okay. So, um, anyway, we bounced around as as kids. Parents were split up, and uh, like most kids that have a split up. Uh, mom and dad, we became kind of the the pawns in that whole marriage that split up. Yeah, pulling you back and forth. Pulling back and forth, family court, you know, just back in child support, all that stuff growing up. Uh, before we moved out to Antioch, when I was a, a freshman in high school, we moved out to Antioch from Daly City. Okay. And we were living in a mobile home. So we lived in a mobile home, uh, the Franciscan Mobile Home Park. It was actually in Coma. And that's what I thought life was, you know, until we moved out this way. And I was, well, it, it is what life was. Yeah, that's how it was. It, we, I was embarrassed to have friends over to, to hang out because I lived in a mobile home. Right. So it was a lot different when we moved out to Antioch um, in 96. So things started changing from there. And did you move into a house when you moved out here? Yeah, we moved into a house. Well, we, we actually, my parents were having their house built my stepmom and my dad. Yeah. And uh, we lived in a trailer, a real trailer, the last six months because they were delayed getting the house built. So we actually lived out in Rio Vista you know, on Brandon Island in uh, a trailer for six months, which sucked. You have to live in a, a four wheeler for, for six months. And how many, it was you and your mom and dad and was, or your stepmom and your dad and who else? My stepmom, my dad, my brother and myself. My okay, brother so four and I, of you in like an RV? Yeah, not an RV, a, a, a trailer. So the one you hook up to the truck and RV is a lot nicer than a trailer. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So, um, and we had just started our new high school out here uh, at that point. So we were living in a trailer, going to school out of the trailer. It was Which school did you go to out here? Uh, Deer Valley High. Okay. And uh, what year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 2001. I should have graduated in 2000, but you know, my mom decided that I did so good in the first grade, I got to do it over twice. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you get a lot more chocolate milk that way. That's right. <laughs> I I love, that's what I remember about kindergarten, first grade, stuff like that. Monday and Friday, chocolate milk. That's right. And that's you why get, I'm a big fatty. You get nap times too. <laughs> yeah. So 2001, Ed, how old do you feel? <laughs> exactly. <Right>. Me too. <laughs> so... You moved out here, and uh, part of the story we're going to talk about today is uh, about your family. We talk about everybody's family here, but uh, I know you guys pretty intimately. Um, now, how long have you and uh, your wife Christina been together? We've been we, uh, Christina and I have been together since two thousand and one, since I graduated, and we've been married since two thousand three. Okay. We actually have an anniversary coming up on November first. So 17 years on the 1st of November, we've been married. And then uh, what were you doing for work when you guys first met? When I first met her, we I was working at Gap Incorporated. I was actually at Old Navy as a sales associate. And I was- Like doing the retail stuff? Yeah, folding, okay. folding clothes and yeah. checking people out. And I had started that job when I was a sophomore in high school and I was working full-time hours my senior year in high school. When I met Christina, I was moving into the loss prevention side of things with Gap. So I was gonna be a rent-a-cop, you might say. It was a cool job. And- I, uh, I remember one of the stories about that, like they chasing some people out at the store. Yeah, so that job was, it was fun. I just, 
had to stop after a while because I didn't want to, you know, get shot or killed. You know, <laughs> yeah, over some over jeans. some clothes, you know. <laughs> so uh, I moved up to the old Navy in Concord, and and I took my job seriously. You know, I was going to stop people from stealing the merchandise, and yeah, it's called loss prevention. Loss Hello. prevention, right? So uh, I was doing a good job, but I was getting a lot of uh, threats, you know. So I ended up uh, leaving that job, and I started working for Kelly Moore Paints. I took a, a pay cut actually by. Four dollars an hour, and I would work at Kelly Moore Paints from six thirty to three thirty, and then I worked at UPS from five to ten. Okay, for benefits, you know. So I had two jobs at that point, and then I did multi-level marketing, uh, sales stuff after I got off work at UPS. You know, the kind of guy that's at a coffee shop and telling you how he's going to change your life. With oh yeah, a, yeah, a website or something. Oh no, I, I, that I've, was me. I fell prey to that a few different times. Yeah, I was the guy that was going to buy find a buddy and get a buddy and make a match and recruit. And uh, it was headhunting is basically what it was, but it taught me sales, I guess. And there's like three people at the top making all the money. Yeah. And then all the minions running around doing the multi-level marketing all over the place. Yep. But they had a vision. I mean, they they taught, they were talking about e-commerce and, and, and shopping online in 2001 and two and ISP providing and having people buy through your website and you get paid. I mean, a great thought, but you were making money on recruiting your buddies to buy into a business. And yeah. And uh, I thought I was going to get rich quick. You know, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, this, we know someone in our neighborhood and there's other people that I know um, who have been in that business, whether it's Mary Kay. Um, there's a few different ones. I can't remember the names of them, but they make tons of money doing mm -hmm. that and they work their asses off, you know? So who knows if you would have stuck with that, you might've done great, right. but, uh, you know, just wasn't in the cards at the time, mm -hmm. you know, it's probably a good thing. So now you have been married for 17 years. You've got a 17 year old named Dylan. That's right. So I'm just doing the math here, but uh, how old were you when you had Dylan? I had just turned 20 years old. And my, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she was 17 when she had our son. Yeah. So at that time, did you go, holy shit? Oh, you know, I did. <laughs> I mean, the whole, the, when I found out, I said, holy shit. Right. You know, but, but, um, I don't know, something changed inside of me in my mindset and I was going to be the provider and I was going to be the guy that just made it happen no matter what. So I always tell people that Dylan, before he was born, he became my why. You know, why I do what I do and why I work as hard as I work is because I want to give my kids everything that I never had and more. Right. Uh, and be an example, you know, a good leader uh, for them. And it was scary. I mean, I was scared to death to have a kid. You know, I was, I didn't even go through my college years yet. You know, I'm not even legal to drink and I had a child. So, yeah. Um, but I can only imagine how my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time felt she was 17 and finishing up her senior year. So she sacrificed a lot at, at that time as well, you know? Yeah. So, well, they, I've said it before on this podcast, you know, and it's like a, a lot of the people that I talk to run through these same situations um, where all of a sudden something happens in their life where they're just like, okay, I got to step up and, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. All of a sudden you just, you, you either step up or you do what my biological father did, which was run the other way. Right. You know, and thank God you stepped up because you got two amazing kids, thank you, you know? So, um, about that same time, I think it was, you got into HVAC. Yes. yes. How'd you get into HVAC? Well, I was working at Kelly Moore Paints and I was doing- the Was that the one here in town or where were you at? Yeah, in Antioch. Yeah. So I was in Antioch. My best friend and I, we were both working there together. It was kind of a cool gig because we, we were living in the same room. We shared a room at, at uh, his mom and dad's house and we were working there and then I would go to UPS at night. So real quick question, who was your roommate? Scott Paoli. Okay. So this is something I was going to bring up too. This guy has so many friends that have been friends for life, yep. you know, and it's something that it, you don't see a lot. I know that I, I've got some friends from back in Northwest Illinois who I grew up with that I can count on one hand. 
and you have a bunch of people that work for you, a bunch of people that are at your house often, like on a weekly basis, Mm -hmm. they're all people that you grew up with. And uh, you keep that core base of people around you all the time. And these are some solid people. Absolutely. And uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Is that something that you have strived to keep in your life? Are you the one keeping all you people together? Or is it all of you kind of made a pact to all stay together? Or how's it all work? Because I see it as something that's kind of unique. Because most people, I'd say, are probably more like me. Where... I talk to people. My, I, I talk to my best friend back in Illinois, maybe two times a year. Okay. You know, to see you guys together all the time, yeah. it's really awesome. But I'd like to kind of dig into a little bit to figure out how do you guys all stay so close all that time. I I don't, I've, I've thought about it. I I I think they're drawn. I think something draws a lot of my friends to to come over and and our openness and our our. Not not our successes, but more or less like the type of people my wife and I are. We're, we're always open arms and we'll give you the shirt off our back if, if, if you needed it. And we'll be honest with you. We'll tell you, hey, I don't think this is right or this is we have. You know what I mean? Like we're just real people. And, and I think people like that and they're attracted to it. But I go months without talking to a buddy of mine named Jimmy and when we're with, when he, when we meet up again, it's like, we didn't miss a heartbeat. Like he knows that I'm not, I understand that he's got life going on and he's got his kids and, and, and his, his job and, and I'm okay with it. I don't get my feelings hurt. It's, it's hard to hurt my feelings. Uh, where my wife, you can hurt her feelings really easily. So, I mean, it's, maybe it's that, maybe it's just that I don't hold it against anybody if they're not there at every single party or every single event. Right. But you're right. We do have a lot of a lot of friends, and we love all of our friends. You can't make new new old friends, right? Yeah, and you got the only thing we don't have a lot of is time. That's right. You know, and I'm going through, and I'm writing a book right now, also called True Ambition, mm-hmm. and I'm writing right now the um, the chapter that's about not wasting any more time. And I'm getting to that point where I'm just like do I really want to set aside my time for this? Do you want to waste your time writing a chapter about not wasting time? Yeah, I know. Right. It It speaks for itself, right? Yeah. Don't waste time. Yeah. Don't waste time. Yeah. You know, it just, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing when you talk about your friend, Jimmy, uh, cause I also know Jimmy through you and what a wonderful person he is. Um, my friend, Mike back in Illinois, same thing. We won't talk for six months. And when we do, we're right back to being, you know, 17 and 15 year old boys back in Mount Carroll. Absolutely. You know, and it's fun to jump back into that. And he'll always call me on my shit and vice versa. He's a state cop back in Illinois. You need that though. You got to, you got into HVAC. I kind of took you off of that. Um, Tell me about how you got that first job. Okay. So I called on a newspaper ad, believe it or not on my lunch break. Newspaper ads, what they used to have. (laughs) <laughs> so Ke- Kelly Moore, they're like, you take an hour lunch, right? You got to take your hour lunch. So I l- I'm looking and I see an ad and my buddy Scott, he's with me. He's like, hey, you can make 500 to $600 a week. Sign me up. Air duct cleaners needed. And I, I called on it and the guy's like, yeah, come in for an interview today at 12 or whatever. So that's like right now. He's like, yeah, come on in. So I drove from Antioch to Martinez, went for this interview. And, it, and when I pulled up to this place, it was like roll up doors. It's a, it was actually a storage facility off of um, the highway there. I'm like, this is a company? Okay, so I go in and he's like, you're hired. You got a truck? I said, yeah. He's like, okay, here's a hat and here's a polo shirt. So I started working for a company called United Air Duct Cleaners. Okay. And um, So was your interview just walking in and having a heartbeat? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I didn't, I, I didn't know anything. I'm, I'm 18, I'm 19 years old, right? So... I was like, okay, I got the job. What do I get paid, right? He's like, well, you get 25% commission and 10% commission on on equipment sales. And I was like, okay, well, what am I gonna be doing? Cleaning ducks? I didn't even know what a duck was, <laughs> but the one that quacks, right? Right. So I took a leap of faith and I just went with it. And I showed up and they rode me along two days with some random guys that were doing the same type of work and I just, I picked it up and and so when you're going out on these calls are you going out and actually selling the job to the people 
So the way it worked is they would advertise these $19, $29 duck cleaning ads in the newspaper. It was a total gimmick. It was a- it That'd was get a, you in the door. Get you in the door. But it was a, it was a uh, more of a fraudulent thing. They, they're shut down. So that company got shut down in California and they're kicked out. They can't do business here anymore. But at the time I worked for them for about six months and I learned the trade a little bit. They got me EPA certified and um, then they laid me off in December of 2002 because it was holidays, the holiday time. And they said, hey, we're slow. We're not advertising and see ya. We'll right. call you when it gets busy again. So I was on unemployment for about a week or two and my son was gonna be born. My girlfriend was pregnant. And so I called on another newspaper ad around February of the next year. And I got hired at a company that wasn't in business yet. Another scam, right? This guy got to be a scam. It's not, this is, can't be happening, but they eventually opened in, on March 17th of 2003. They weren't open yet. So they were just forming the company and they were looking for salespeople. They were forming the company and looking for all the different positions within the company. Okay. So, but I didn't understand any of that yet. Cause I'm still young and dumb and, and so I go for this interview and it's this nice office like we're sitting in now. And I'm like, this is, is this like the boiler room stuff or what? Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the vice president goes, I really like you. I want you to meet Kevin, the owner. And I said, okay, he's all, he's not here. So I want you to come back for another interview. And this is in San Ramon. I'm like, oh, I got to drive back down here and yeah. take another interview for a scam, <laughs> yeah. for a scam. So right. I did, I met Kevin and his mom, came in in my, in, in my interview because she said, wanted to say hi to her son. It was the weirdest interview you ever had in your, I ever had in my life. And uh, they hired me. Well, they didn't open for a month. So I got hired in February. They opened March 17th. And uh, the You're great- like, uh, hello, uh, my kid's coming. Yeah, my kid's coming, right? He was due in <laughs> April and he came a month early. So he came in March. Uh, he came nine days after I started for this company. And uh, the great news is I got benefits the first day I started because I, I was a ground floor team member with a brand new company. So medical, got it. Yeah. So well, in, in, the, in those situations, God just shows up. God showed up, man. Totally. Because my wife was covered by her dad or my girlfriend, but my son wasn't going to be covered four days after he was born because right. April 1st was the way medical works. It's just a, 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 a shell game. Yeah. So it worked out, we were blessed. And I worked for them for just under 10 years and became one of the best, the best selling technicians in the country from 2006 to 2012. And I got my claim to fame, you know, doing that for, for this company. Now this company is a $60 million company in the Bay Area. So that company that was just being started mm -hmm. in, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, 2003. 2003. You helped to build it up to, it's a $60 million company now. Yep. yep. When I left, it was a $20 million company. So when you left, um, you left to start your own company, right? Right. And uh, what year was that? So I left April of 20, 2012 to start my own business. And I started my business with a 50-50 partner. Okay. And if I could give anybody any advice is uh, for me, be your own owner, be a hundred percent. It's your way. You do it the way you want to do it. 50, 50 partnerships. I, uh, I have a bad, bad, uh, omen towards those. Like I don't, uh, bad thoughts towards 50, 50 partnerships just well, because you, I thought mine was going to be rock solid. You know, I had the best partner. I looked up to him like a father, you know, he's 20 years older than me, more mature. And, and he taught me technical side of my trade and it didn't work out for me that way. You know, so yeah, yeah, I had a, uh, you know, the story about this too. And you and I had talked about this kind of stuff before sometimes in your hot tub. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, we, Carissa and I started this company it Avalon back eight years ago. And a few years ago we had a, a friend of mine who wanted to invest in the company. And, uh, that turned out to be just an absolute shit show. And, uh, we look back and the great thing about it is while we can go, okay, I don't want to ever do that again. Both of us learned valuable, valuable lessons from what we went through in that situ and those situations and everything we learned so we can come out the other end now and go, 
oh, I don't want to do that again, but I'm so glad I did so I can be here now so much smarter and so much stronger on the other side of it. Absolutely. Isn't that the, isn't that the positive? That's the great thing that we learn a lesson every, anytime we do something where we make a mistake and we fall down, we just learned a lesson. And as long as we learn from it and we come back stronger, the better off we're going to be. Exactly. And that's why I, I look for the good in, in things. So even if it's a negative, it's how, how we spin that positive because if we always see the negative, everything's going to always be negative. Exactly. Nothing's going to go right in your life, whether or not you have the most money in the world or the biggest business. If you're, if you're not looking at the positive things, it doesn't matter. Right. So for, for me, I started that company, my first company, I was 29 years old and I thought I knew it all. And I, and I, I was ready at that point to start. I'm so happy that I did. And it's just, I, I, would have rather started all on my own than, than with a partner because that turned out to be not so good for me um, for the first company that I started. Well, you talked about uh, <clears throat> something else that kind of uh, rang true in my head. Uh, first company that I went to work for as a technical recruiter, as a headhunter back then. I also added, a, answered an ad in the paper. It was in the Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Don't see those anymore, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but this one said, make $100,000 a year. Don't pass up this ad. And I'm like, I want to make 100000 I think at the time, I maybe made like $10,000 a year delivering pizzas and playing in bands. You know, I was that guy. And uh, went in, they gave you a phone and you got the Sunday want ads and you just started calling on making sales calls in the morning and making recruiting calls in the afternoon. And there was a guy standing, uh, uh, my first boss, Ken, standing over going, get on the phone. If your phone's not open, then your business is closed. If you don't want that seat, there's four people behind me waiting outside that'll take it. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, you right? know, I better get on the phone. You know, so while it was, you, you mentioned Boiler Room. Mm -hmm which is a great movie, but it was that same kind of mentality where it was not the best uh, work environment to be in, but it was a great training environment for me and myself and a few other people who were in that um, uh, uh, environment are still very successful as in the staffing and recruiting uh, industry. So while it's not the, the best place to be as far as you think at the time. It's such a great place to learn because while it might be like a, a kind of a scheme that's going on, mm -hmm. there's still some hustling going on behind the scenes to get shit done. There's drive, there's motivation. And, and, and you're here, you're where you're at because you have that in your, in your back quiver, you know, to use exactly those against rebuttals or uh, objections to whatever it is that you're, you're selling because nothing happens until somebody sells something to somebody else. That's the way the world works. Yeah. Period. 2012, you started that company. Uh, I had one question. Mm -hmm. Is there a ton of overhead when you start your own company in HVACs? I, I know it goes on in staffing and recruiting. Is there a ton of overhead starting a company uh, doing HVAC? I mean, it seems like you guys, there's like, trucks, there's products, there's all kinds of stuff. Is there a ton of overhead when you're doing that? It depends on how you do it. You know, my my previous boss that I worked for, he started his with half a million dollars, which isn't a lot today by today's standards. But to me, it was a lot. I didn't have half a million dollars to start my company. So I had, we started our business on 104,000 in 2012. And I think we touched 24,000 of that money. And then we just took the distribution back out my partner and I, Yeah. Um, it didn't take a whole lot, but it takes a lot of making sure that you have the right people on the seats because we have a lot of seats in HVAC. We have warehouse, we have runners, we have installers, we have helpers, we have HR, we have accounting, uh, permits, all these seats on the bus have to be um, sat in the, by the right person. And my partner and I were doing a lot of those, wearing all those hats, yeah. you know, at the time. So the other thing is that what we had that my partner, my ex-partner used to say is that we have the secret weapon. What's the secret weapon? He's all you. You're the secret weapon, dude. He's all you are the secret weapon because there's nobody that can do what you can do when you're out 
at clients' homes. Clients love you. And if we ever needed to make more money or whatever, we have you. Like you're the secret weapon. Mm -hmm. or the magic sauce is what my buddy Mike calls me. My right-hand man at my company now. So it's kind of cool when you hear that kind of stuff. It feels good, you know. Well, the only time I heard something like that was actually from that guy who bought into the company. And uh, while that was a bad situation, or it ended up bad, uh, the things that I learned from that was almost the same thing. Because I'm looking for, at the time, looking for salespeople, I'm looking for recruiters, but mostly for salespeople. Salespeople is always the hardest thing to find. Mm -hmm. And he came up and said, listen, no one is going to sell your services and sell your company and sell you like you are. No one's as motivated and nobody's as good at it. You know, and it's one of those things where I'm not sitting here patting myself in the back like I know you're not. It's just the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, so we go out and we hire people and we put butts in seats like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But we have to take care of those people, you know, because we want to have them go out and sell our companies the best that they can. And how do we best do that? We've got to take care of those people like they're one of our family, you know. So it's like it was an interesting thing when he told me, listen, no one's going to sell like you're going to sell it. And it was a big realization for me to go, oh, light bulb. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I was just thinking that maybe they, he just wanted me to do all the work. <laughs> right. So he's just telling me that. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No, you're right. Yeah. You're no, right. It's, it, it, it's, one of those, it's one of those things where you don't realize it until somebody – It it's almost like – um, somebody almost gives you um, their perspective on something and then the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh, yeah, no kidding. Right. And, uh, and, and for you and I, we, have, we hold ourselves to a high, a high standard. Um, we're harder on ourselves than anybody could be on us. So sometimes you have to look at the salespeople and say, well, what are they doing right? And, and they're never going to be me. And sometimes I have I have trouble going, well, why didn't they just do it this? I go, why didn't they just do it? And then my, I have to take a step back. And my wife, she'll say, if they're just half of you, that's all we need. And so sometimes we have to remember that as owners and, and entrepreneurs, is they're not going to be, all of them aren't going to be like us. So they'd have their own business. They'd be doing it themselves. Yeah, exactly. So I agree. They're hard to find. And when you find a good salesperson, you want to keep, keep them for sure. Yeah, big time. So- what year did you start Perfect Star? I started Perfect Star just at the end of 2016. So my partner and I split up due to all sorts of issues of stealing money, things like that on his end. And I wasn't able to operate Perfect Star until March of 2017, but I set up the company in 2016. Okay. Due to my fiduciary duties to my previous company. Okay. So. And uh, who's Perfect Paul? Perfect Paul is, is this creature or superhero, not creature. He's our mascot, I guess. <laughs> He's a creature. So my wife, my wife comes up with these great ideas of, we got to have a mascot. And she's right. It's great for marketing. Mascots are great. I'm like, we don't need a mascot. You know, I'm a guy, like you said, I like to work. I like to get my hands dirty. I'm not thinking about mascots. So she's like, well, good, because I got a costume being made. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, it's really expensive, but it's only going to fit you, so you, you'll be the one that has to wear it. And I'm like, well, how much is this costume? And where is it being made? And she's <laughs> like, I said, it's being made in England. And she's like, yeah, that's where they make the costumes for Disneyland and everything else. I said, oh, my God, how much is this costume going to be? <laughs> right? I, didn't even get, I never even found out the true cost of this costume, but this thing comes. Well, luckily, she never told you. Right, and it's got this, this uh, head and everything. It's full-on mascot. And she's all, we got to name it. And I said, we got to name it. She's like, yeah, what do you think? Uh, perfect. I said, we'll name it Perfect Star. She's like, we can't name it Perfect Star. Uh, perfect, perfect Pete. I said, I like Perfect Pete. She's like, I don't, I don't, it doesn't ring right. So then we come up with this Perfect Paul. And so we have this uh, costume and a mascot and a name. And we put it out. I wore the costume at an event over here in uh, Brentwood where we live, the parade. Yeah. And it was a freaking hit. So again, my wife was uh, right. Everybody loves Perfect Paul. With COVID, we're not out there doing Perfect Paul greetings and stuff, but 
we're going to start when we can again, you know? Well, he's, uh, he's on the side of all your trucks. That's right. Because when Johnny and I go out for our walks in the morning, my, my son is a little over two years old. And uh, if he's walking and not in the stroller, he goes directly to Perfect Paul on the side of the truck. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's a great thing. And it's, People always, Chris, Perfect Paul. I'm like, I'm not Perfect Paul. It just worked out coincidentally. Yeah, perfect Chris just sounds stupid. Yeah, it, it kind of looks like me, but it's not me. That's not <laughs> what we were going for. And again, my wife, we got to rewrap all the trucks. We're not going to rewrap all the trucks. That costs thousands and thousands of dollars. So rewrapping the trucks. And she was right again. So we rewrapped the trucks. It ended up working out for us. Well, that's something I am uh, just was reading about. I can't remember what book it was, but, you know, they say in business, if you're worrying about the spending, then you're worrying about the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You need to be worrying about the revenue and then the spending won't be a problem. That's right. You know, so worry about, um, I, I, I've been notoriously guilty of where are we spending the money? Where are we doing this? Where are we doing that? You know, where it's like, if you just worry about the revenue and building that revenue, then you don't have to worry about the spending. You, you still have to keep a handle on it, of course. Right. You know, you can't just be out there throwing money around, making it rain. Giving everybody a credit card. Oh, yeah. Go, yeah. go have fun. Go have fun, yeah. You know, but it, if, you're, if you're out there and you're just building the revenue, then you can have as many Perfect Paul costumes as you want to because the more Perfect Paul costumes you have, more the more people know who Perfect Star is. So uh, um, one of the other questions I had, because I looked at your website, was you have something called Star Members. That's right. What are those? Star members are our maintenance program clients. So we offer a maintenance program to homeowners where we come out twice a year and we service their equipment automatically and it's included with the service program. So it's kind of like a gym membership for your HVAC equipment, something you don't have to worry about, automatic. And those are, all, I call them our loyal clients because people that are on our star membership program, they only do business with, with Perfect Star. So the more of those that we have in our in our company, the more valuable our company is, and and the more less downtime we have during the slower months. You know? And the people who are star members, it just kind of keeps their stuff up to date, keeps mm -hmm. it all yep. in perfect shape. Keeps it all perfect shape. Filters, you know, people look at their filters <clears throat> and they think, "Well, I do it once a year, or I do it twice a year." So if I were to do that then you guys would change the filters we as well we would service your filters we'd wash your unit outside with with a, a coil cleaner tighten all the electrical in the system make sure it's safe for the winter gas check gas leak checks all that stuff yeah we do it all that's awesome and what's I, great about it is we 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 come across things that people never knew were an issue so we don't look for any things. We just notice things when we're there. And sometimes it's with the plumbing or with the insulation in the attic. So we're able to tell the client, hey, you got a mice issue, mouse issue, or, or hey, um, does your, does your kids, do your kids have allergies or, or asthma? I saw the, the inhaler on the counter. Oh yeah, my son suffers big time. Well, why are you using this cheap hog hair filter that is only going to catch beard cans and bowling balls and you're not using something that's catching the stuff that's making your kids sick right do you want to look at that and, and people like that they want to know people today they want to know hey is there a filter product that i could put in that will beat covid19 they want to know if right. you're not sharing that information you're missing you're missing the opportunity well, that's so. a good segue how has covid19 changed your business in regards to revenue or in regards no, in, to in regards to like uh we can talk about revenue as well um but in regards to like going out and going into people's homes oh it's changed dramatically so now we're in the beginning we didn't know much about it so it was kind of like we were having the crews drive in separately so we used to have two guys in a truck or even three mm -hmm. and then we were having one guy in the truck the other one would follow in his personal car and they would go to a house, you know, we did the masks from the get-go, the nitro gloves or the latex gloves. We were contactless. The, cu the client leaves the credit card on the counter. When we're done, we grab it, we get payment. We never even see them, right? So it's just been, that was the beginning. Now it's kind of getting where everybody's kind of learning how to, how to react and act with each other uh, in, in this 
pandemic. So, but it's been pretty seamless for us. I mean, we were already wearing masks. We already had gloves, but it's just, we have to be efficient at doing it. Um, cleanliness, you know, those, those types of things. Yeah. Just being extra cautious, extra cautious. Yeah. yeah. So as far as, uh, has your business been hurt at all by COVID? I mean, as far as revenue, as far as growth and any kind of thing like that, what, what have you seen for that? No, our growth has been record. We've had record months the last three months in a row in growth and uh, spending less in marketing. So I'm spending less in marketing and I'm growing, which is always a great thing mm -hmm. uh, when you could do that. We've had more revenue, obviously. The things that we're, we're noticing is the culture and the, the, I don't know how you say it, the, some people use a pandemic to kind of for their own gain, you might say. So a lot of a lot of sick calls, just dealing with a lot of those those things in business, you know, where you got a guy out for two weeks because he has to quarantine or whatever. For my business, that's detrimental. Right. If I have a lead installer out for two weeks, I can't run a truck. Well, if each truck makes ten thousand dollars a day in revenue, yeah, do the math. Do the math. That's a hundred thousand easily. So we've had those issues, but we've been able to to uh, adjust to them. Uh, because of me. So I'll go in the field and I'll take that guy's spot, which my wife doesn't want me to do, but sometimes you do what you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I clean the toilets here. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> sweep. Know? I mop. Yeah. Not very good, but yeah, I'll do whatever I need do to do. Do whatever it takes. But, you know, going back to what you were talking about with uh, the, the star members, um, I've had many things in my house that you've upgraded, mm -hmm. um, including, you know, keeping Johnny's room at a certain temperature because they didn't put uh, the builder didn't put a, a thermostat in there, and uh, we put in some uh, like HEPA cleaners or something like that. What mm -hmm. was that? We put some kind of uh, air thing scrubbers. In there. Air scrubbers, right? You know, so it's just like I would have never even thought about it. You know, but I've got the guru living next door to me. You know, who you know comes over and says, "Hey, you should try this." I'm like, "Okay," you know, I want to have, I want to breathe good air. Right. I'm like, I. I so my, my beginnings was a technician. I was a maintenance technician making $13 an hour for the company that I was working for. And when they moved to performance pay, that's where I saw my uptick in my, my income. And I started making $300,000 a year because I was really good at what I did. But it was identifying needs for clients and then finding a solution, kind of like a doctor. You know, doctor, you go in, you get diagnosed, he finds a solution. So, th so that's... That's what I love to do. I love to fix stuff. I'm a guy that I love to work. Like you said earlier in, in the beginning, I don't stop because I just like to work. People are like, why are you doing that? Because I like working with my guys elbow to elbow. It's something that I enjoy. I'm starting to realize that. And I didn't know that before because I, I'm learning still. I'm, I'm 37 years old. I'll be 38 this month. And I'm still learning a lot of stuff about myself, you know, yeah. as, as I go through life, you know. And really all you're doing it, we're in completely different businesses, but all we're really doing is the same thing, which is solving problems for our customers. And if you go in and you solve problems the right way, um, you're not going to gouge people, mm -hmm. but you can charge them a fair amount of money and give them a great product and everybody's happy in the end, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's that's a nice thing. Um, one of the other things that I know that you're passionate about, which my wife, Carissa, and I are in our company, IT Avalon, is, is giving back to the community. Um, you guys were awesome enough to be involved in the Shirley Ann Foundation. And, uh, but you have something that you guys do as well as a company. W what's that? We do a Perfect Star Gives Back. It's a Perfect Star Gives Back program. So and what, what we, does that do? That's just what we call it. So it's anything that we do in the community or donations or, or charitable contributions. So what we do every month without, without falter is we do a, a donation, charitable donation of $10 for every tune-up that we run. We donate $10 to Tony, LaRus Tony LaRusso's ARF Foundation, the Food Bank of Contra Costa County, uh, the Sempre Fee Fund, you know, for 9-11, uh, post 9-11 um, workers and stuff like that. We do the, we're doing the breast cancer uh, one right now. 
Yeah. But it's just every single month we have a, a charitable contribution that we do. We also are a big part of uh, the Lennox Feel the Love program. So we're a Lennox dealer. And this was our second year doing Lennox's Feel the Love, which is where Lennox will provide a, a free furnace or an air conditioner for a family in need. And we install it for free. Well, we took it a step fur further this year and last year where we said, hey, we're not going to just give them the furnace that Lennox gave it gave us for free. We're going to give we're going to give them an air conditioner as well. So we gave someone a full system and we just did that about a week ago. We just finished that fill the love program. It was great. That's for, awesome. For a family out here in Brentwood and the sister's been caring for her brother for a decade or more who has MS. So he has to keep his house at a constant temperature and they were unable to do that till we put in a new system for them. Um, so they were taking him to the grocery store in his wheelchair to, to keep him comfortable when it was really hot oh my during, God. The, during the heat wave. Yeah. So when you think you have it bad, you're kind of like, put a dollar figure on that. You can't. Yeah. And that's the, it makes you feel good. Doesn't it? When you, when you do things like that, it's not, Oh, what's in it for me with them. What's in it for me? No, it's not about that. It's about, I like to feel good. I like when I do good things for people that need it. Uh, just like you, I'm sure. I well, mean, that's you, why you, you do it. You go out and you do it for people and then you get it back tenfold, you know, without even trying. Exactly. You know, you're, you're, I'm, I'm not saying you're going out to do it because of that. Mm -hmm. It's just if you go out and do things for the right reasons, first of all, you feel amazing. You're helping out a family who, for God's sake, had to go to the grocery store to cool down because the guy had MS, has right. MS. Mm -hmm. And now you just took care of a situation for them that's gonna make them happy for the next 20 years. That's right. Yeah, and look at the sacrifice that his sister made for him, caring for him all these years, like sacrificing her life for her brother. Like it's just a really cool, it was a really great experience. And the year before we did the children's autis autistic home in Oakley, where we were able to actually have our whole team there on a Saturday, they donated their time not getting paid to go out there and, and do that project. And it was, we had like 40 or 50 people there. It was, it was awesome. That was before COVID. So this year it was a little more restrictive, but yeah. it's still a great, we were talking about it today in my company. It's a, it's such a great thing when your company rallies behind you and, and they have the same vision as you as the owner and they support it. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing is my people love doing that stuff and being a part of it. Yeah. You know, so you give them a paycheck, but uh, if they can get involved in and we can all get involved in something like that, it brings the whole company together. Well, paycheck is only going to keep them with you for so long until someone gives them a bigger paycheck. So right. sometimes it's it's not always about the money. Does the money help? Yeah, it helps. But if they love where they work and they love who they work for, they'll never leave you. It doesn't matter if this guy's telling them that he's going to give them two more bucks or what have you. It's people want to feel like their family. They want to feel a part of something bigger and better and, and feel like they're going somewhere and growing. Right. Yeah. Or if they do leave you, you leave on good terms because they're friends of yours and people have to move on. Absolutely. You know, it, it hurts because those people become friends of yours and almost family. Mm -hmm. But you know, then I, I just had a conversation with a guy who, um, I had to let go, um, a year ago or so. And he and I've known each other for, 14 years since I've been in California and uh, it was nice just to be able to call him up and go, Hey, I see your Niners are doing great. My Vikings suck. You know, how's the baby doing all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been in situations before where I didn't handle it the right way. And I don't have as good a relationship with people who I used to work with either as employees or as coworkers, because maybe I wasn't mature enough to figure out that we're just supposed to treat each other like human beings and then come out the other side of this. It's work, you know, nobody has to be here. I don't have to be here, you know, but if we treat it the right way and we treat each other with respect, then, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens in the end. We're all just trying to get through this crazy thing called life mm -hmm. and uh, come out the other end of it, good people. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. So, um, you and I have talked about it a little bit before, but your numbers are, eclipsing what you were doing in your business before, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the same level as the, as the previous business that I had. 
So we were four, about four years old, we're, and we grew our business from zero to 10 million. We had 54 employees, and I'm at that level of revenue with 35 employees. So it just goes to show the, the management behind the revenue, right? So we didn't need 20 less, 20 less people to do the same revenue right. than we were doing before with my, with my ex-partner. Um, and and maybe, maybe none of the profits are walking out the door. None of the profits. Yeah, that's you know, another profits walking out of the door. And, and uh, looking back at that whole s- situation, that was a really bad time of my life. Like when I when I lost my company, I felt I lost my company in 2016 and sitting there for the November, December, because that happened in October of 2016. And my kids going, Dad, just just go to the shop. It's your shop. And I couldn't. It, it was one of those things. It's like it could have put me it put me into a depression and God got me out of it. Somehow I saw the light, my wife, my kids, and I was able to start this company and and do tenfold yeah. and faster. And, it, and it, it goes to show that, you know, you stay positive and, and, and know that there's going to be a better outcome Yeah, because it was a pretty dark time. for. Well, me. I remember when we first moved in. Uh, next door to you and uh, it was uh, we had a couple conversations where um, from both sides we kind of needed each other just to have a conversation Mm -hmm. like this Mm -hmm. to kind of talk you off a ledge Mm -hmm. and go no it's gonna be okay this is a learning experience you're gonna come out the other end stronger better you know and I needed the same thing from you so sometimes you just need those people in your life where you can sit there and maybe God put us together for a reason so we could help each other out in those situations, you know, because right now you're in a whole different place, a whole better place than, uh, you know, when I first met, when you were coming out mm-hmm. of that bad situation and you guys are kicking ass yeah. right now. And I can see it every day. Yeah. We, we were distracted the first part of our, of our opening because after going through the thing with my business, I went through it with my brother, you know, so sometimes you find new brothers in life, you know, yeah. like, like you and I met, which is been great for me. You've helped me grow tremendously. But uh, looking back at it, it was like, how many more things are just going to keep coming and coming? Well, you said it before. If you concentrate on the negative, more and more More negative stuff's going to keep coming because all you can see is the negative and you can't understand why life isn't getting better. Right. You know, when in reality, um, it's almost like, you know, you know, I'm a, a recovering alcoholic. I've been sober six years. And one Congratulations, the things, by the way. Thank you. One, one, one of the things you have to learn is that if you're willing to walk through the door, there's no lock in the door. The door's already open. You just have to walk through it. You know, nobody's holding you back. You just have to walk through it. And it's hard to do. You know, after years and years of drinking, doing whatever you're doing, mm-hmm. it, that, that's all you know. And, you know, we're all creatures of habit. And when I quit drinking, I I couldn't imagine not going out for a drink. I couldn't imagine a Friday night and not sitting in my backyard, you know, drinking my Jägermeister and a case of beer, you know, just couldn't imagine it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine going on a sales call and not having drinks with my clients, you know, because I was big John. I was the big party guy, you know, but then all of a sudden you realize that you don't have to do it anymore. You can look at the positive side of things and it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You can get rid of all the negative things that happened in your life. If you just let them go, you know, so I, I I leaned on you just as much when we moved in for things I was going through as you did for me. So thank you too. You're welcome. Thank you. So I talked about drinking a little bit and everybody knows in my life that uh, I had a drinking problem. Now, you and I have uh, talked pretty uh, intimately about the fact that back in the day, you drank a little bit too much, too. Yeah, I drank a lot. I mean, I started drinking right when I turned 21. Uh, Christina and I got married at Harvey's or Harrah's, you know. Oh, yeah, up in Tahoe? Yeah, we got married there uh, November 1st of 2003. Okay. And that, I turned 21 October 28th of 2003. Party so, time. Party time. <laughs> Gamble and party, right? Oh, yeah. And the kind of industry that I'm in, it was, it's widely accepted drinking and, and all sorts of other stuff. It was actually, it was more or less seemed like it was encouraged on company trips and events. It was like, we drank. 
Yeah. And we, we partied hard and I got, I liked Bud Light. That was my, that was my go-to. That's what I drank all the time. And another buddy of mine would come over over the, on the weekend and we would drink a 30 pack each in a, a day. Bud Light? A Bud Light in a no, day. In no way is this an advertisement for Bud Light people. I'm just mm-hmm. saying it. That's, that's what he used to drink, but it's in no way an advertisement. Back to you. So we would drink cases and we thought we were cool. Like drinking 30 pack to yourself. Like, yeah, we're cool. Yeah. Stack and, them up in a pyramid. Yeah. Looking back at pictures. I mean, every picture I took, I had one of those cans in my hand and I don't think I realized how bad it was until in 2010, I got a DUI. And at that point, it was my birthday. It was my 28th birthday on October 28th. And I went to the Giants World Series. They are finally in the World Series in 2010. And I went with two of our friends and my wife, the four of us. And it was actually the first time, John, I wasn't drinking like I usually would have drank. And I got a DUI. And so embarrassing, right? Calling your boss and you're, hey, I'm, I'm in jail or whatever. And it was a moment of my life that was just like, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop. This is embarrassing. I never want to have this happen again. It was a nightmare. But I didn't. I didn't stop drinking. It slowly kept coming up and I slowly kept drinking more and more and more. I didn't drive, but I was drinking just the same amount as I did before. It wasn't until I almost lost my family till I stopped till I stopped and I stopped drinking Bud Light altogether. It was that was my it was like a something that my ticker, I guess. I don't know what it is, but it wasn't until 2014, 15 when I stopped drinking it altogether and it, life got better. You know, I Way was missing I was missing a lot of stuff like Gosh, it, it consumed me. Like in the morning, I'd put it in a coffee cup to hide it, to drink it. You know, at, at kids' sporting events, you know, your kids are playing sports and the parents are in the stands drinking. Like, that was me. I was one of those guys. Yeah. I was missing out on life altogether. So I was a heavy, I was a big time heavy drinker. And then, and then I stopped. And it was kind of one of those enlightening moments where it was like, it was hard. Believe me, it was not easy. And, 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 uh, but it was the best thing I ever could have done. You, you didn't quit drinking altogether. Um, like I did, I, I had to, I, I've got, I'm a true, uh, what they call an alcoholic where if I touch it to my lips, I'm not going to stop. And I know that about myself. Um, but you, you can have like a glass of wine. You can do stuff like that. But the interesting thing is, um, since we've known each other, I've never seen you drunk. Not once. I don't want to be drunk. Not like I was before. I mean, I was not in control and I did so many hurtful things. I, I, I would diarrhea at the mouth. You know, you just say, you don't think you're being mean, but you're saying a lot of obnoxious. I was obnoxious. I was that guy. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, I'm a driver. So I would just be that guy. And it, you, you don't want to see that guy. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy. And I don't want my, my son who's at 17, my why in life, to look at me and say, that's, that's my dad. You know, I want to be a better role model for him right? and my daughter, who's my, my daughter's my favorite, my favorite daughter, right? My son's my favorite son. (laughs) You know, my daughter always says, I'm your favorite, right? I said, you're my favorite daughter. I love you so much. (laughs) You ain't lying. Yeah. She's all, well, Dylan's mom's favorite. And I said, he's my favorite son. Yeah. She's like, that's not fair. (laughs) So well, I, she's, I, she's a spitfire she is, and she's going to be gorgeous too. So get the guns ready. They're ready. They're ready. No boys, no yeah, boys in my house. That's right. I sniff them out, get them out of here. But, um, no, my, my, it's nice to hear that you say you haven't seen me, uh, drunk like that. That's a, that's a good, oh, I've been sober for a long time. So I get to watch everybody do the shit that I used to do. <laughs> you know, So I get to sit there and, uh, Look, and I, I don't judge anybody. Anybody can do whatever the hell they want to because God knows I did. You know, but what I get to do now, which I'm blessed for, is get to be um, that hopefully pillar for my son mm-hmm. and protect, be a protector and be someone who 
um, people can ask advice from because the guy six and a half years ago was not someone you're going to ask advice from, you know? So I'm just proud of you for what you did. Um, we're all different. Um, as far as, you know, I know what I need to do. You know what you need to do. We just need to back each other up and, um, you know, kind of help each other out when we need it. So good on you. Um, couple last questions. One is, uh, you and your wife are best friends. You guys have been through a ton together, Mm -hmm. you know, from the time you guys were in high school together, having babies early, building companies, splitting up companies, building the company you're in right now. How do you separate business, pleasure, family, all that stuff, still keep it fresh. Cause I see you guys laughing and having a great time all the time. Advice for other people who are trying to build a business or trying to get ahead and trying to separate business from pleasure. How do you guys keep it all separate and keep having a good time? That's a tough question. I'll answer it the best that I can. So when I started the first company I had, Christina wasn't involved. It was like she was almost shunned out by my, my partner. Mm-hmm. When I started this other company, I, I, she, she's involved. I mean, she came up with the name. She came up with, she, she was included and we, we've grown and prospered from it, but she's not in the office day in and day out. She's, she's there when she's around, when she needs to be around with certain things. So I think the, I couldn't work with my wife every single day. Yeah, I would go crazy. I, I have to get away from I have to get out and do what I, what I'm great at. And that's what I do. And, and she probably needs to get away from you. She needs to get away from me. Absolutely. Cause <laughs> my wife's the same she way. She says I'm crazy. So I'm, I'm sure. She, <laughs> is it me or is it her? It's but probably both of you. It's that <clears throat> we're the yin and the yang. Yeah. So my wife is that loving, emotional, in tune with her feelings. She can tell you a million reasons why she married me and loves me. And if you were to ask me why, I go, oh, because the way your hair shimmers in the sun, you know, think, thinking like that, you know, because I'm trying to, and you put me on the spot. It's, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about as your yeah, feelings. Let, let me get you a card. Where I'm more of a guy is like, we can get in an argument and I'm good. Down, like, if, leave me alone. I'm good. Like if, an hour later, I don't even need to talk about it anymore. So I think it's just that our, our, who we are, that we're, we're a good a good combo. Um, and we don't think about it all that much. Yeah. I mean, if I'm always thinking about, Oh, how am I going to keep the business and professional and, and home life separate? It's really not right. It's they're there business and pleasure. They mix all the time. When you're a business owner, it's just, it happens. My son came to work with me all summer and I put him on payroll, made him pay taxes this year. Last year I was just paying him cash. Right. Bad idea. He yeah. got to learn what it's like to pay taxes. So he's starting to learn, right? He's pissed at me, but <laughs> he learned a lesson, right? This year he'll get money back. <laughs> no, I'll probably have to pay ta- more taxes because he's on my tax return. Who knows? Right, right. I don't know anything about that stuff. Yeah. But um, I don't know. It just, it works. And she is my best friend. She's always going to be my best friend. And we have all those pillow talk nights that no one ever hears those talks we have at pillow talk. You know, it's right. like you, ne- you can't ever, I can't ever judge someone's relationship when I don't lay my head on the pillow with them. So it's the same as, as nobody can judge mine. It's just, we work, things work out. And uh, when we fight, we fight, we fight good. Like it's a knockout drag out fight, but we don't touch each other, but you know, (laughs) I'm stubborn and she wants to stand there and talk it out. And I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm the flight. She's the fight. Yeah. So I think it's the, the opposites in us keep things working. You know, That's where they awesome. need, where they need to be. Yeah. And she's kept me grounded all these years. Cause I, I wanted to start my business in 2007. She said, you're not ready. She's all, baby, you're not ready. I got my license with the CSLB in 20, 2007. Never didn't use it for five years. I waited to start my company because my wife said, baby, you're not ready. You're not ready. And she was right. Who knows where I would have went if I left the company that I was working for in 2007. Right probably not going to be where I'm at today. That's for sure. Cause I wouldn't have learned all the things I need to learn to start my own business. 
Timing is everything. Yeah. You got to be ready. You got to be ready and you got to be willing to do the things that nobody else is willing to do. You have to get down to the nitty gritty. When you're in business, the gloves come off and you have to get down to work. It's not just, I start my own business, hire people and I'm going to make money. It doesn't work that way. It's just that easy. It's, it doesn't work that way, right? Right. You got to think about workman's comp, uh, liability insurance, just all those things you never even thought about. And you're going, uh, why am I pulling permits? Why am well, I not just sure doing it myself? They, they sure as hell don't teach you that in school. Now, and if you didn't go to school, right, you, you wouldn't know. Yeah. So I, I got great grades in high school, but I never went to college. I went to college for two weeks. And I'm not promoting not going to college. I'm just saying I'm not a, I, I have no degree. I wanted to work and I wanted to make money. And I, while I was making money and my buddies were going to school for a career they had no idea what they were going to do, a lot of them ended up working with me or for me right. at some point. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. But, um, I'm the same way. I, I didn't go to college either, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, it wasn't because I chose that, but it's like <clears throat> some, some part of me knew I didn't, I didn't even take my SATs. Mm -hmm. I just knew I wasn't going, you know, I, I hardly made it through high school. You know, it's just like I, I could not, <clears throat> I couldn't, I'm putting it in the book right now. I had a history teacher who I, you know, he was going to fail me and I wasn't going to graduate high school. And I said, listen, don't you me. don't want me back. I don't want to come back. Let's figure this out. Like, yeah, he, he gave me a test. He goes, you come in tomorrow, take this, study this. And of course, then I went and studied it. I passed it. No problem. But it's just like, you know, I was the king procrastinator at mm. stupid stuff like that. Amen, brother. You know, it's like then I just wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to be the person I could be, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't I didn't have a bunch of people telling me I couldn't do things. I was like, I just kept on um, self-destructing or self-sabotaging everything I did prior to being at the point where Christina told you, okay, now you're ready. Mm -hmm. You know, people can see that kind of stuff. And uh, I don't think I was ready until I really got sober, you know, ready to be what, uh, you know, whatever I am now, you know, but I, I'm a way better person today than I was back then. And I wasn't ready for anything back then. So, um, you know, I, I'm glad you went into that a little bit because you guys are a great couple. Thank you. And uh, it's awesome to see uh, a success story. Mm. Uh, there's way more stories about people who got pregnant in high school that didn't, that make, didn't it. make it. Well, and that's what we were told. You're not going to make it. Oh, yeah, Is that your kid? <clears throat> Is it your kid? Is it? So, so I haven't talked to my father since 2004, you know, because because of growing up, growing up was hard for me and my brother. And, and we didn't grow up in a, in a family style home that you, that you would think of on the Waltons. Like it didn't work that way for us. We were, Night, John boy. we were alone all the time. We took the bus, two buses to school on our own in, in fifth grade, fourth, sixth grade, all the way through in, in daily city, San Francisco. Like we were by ours together, just the two of us, you know, for the most part. And, uh, we didn't have anything. We didn't have the means to go buy whatever we wanted. My, my shoes were my brother's old shoes. I'm a year, we're a year apart. So my shoes weren't worn out till my toes stuck out the, the ends of them. You know, that's, that's the kids we were. Yeah. And, um, I never wanted my kids to be, to grow up that way, you know? So it's, it's, it's why I do what I do. Well, I've I, sat, I've sat around a dinner table with you and your family <clears throat> and held hands in a circle around and said grace mm -hmm. before dinner. Um, it's touching and it means something to the whole family. And uh, it's amazing to see your kids and thank God you guys stuck together through it all because they're going to be amazing adults. Thank so you. keep doing what you're doing. Um, I'm going to end with the same question that I ask everybody at the end of the True Ambition podcast. So knowing what you know now, being where you are at now, um, what is your true ambition in two ways? What's your true ambition in your career and in your business? And what is your true ambition in your personal life? In business, it's it's to take as many people with me to the top. 
I don't want to be there on my own, you know? So what that means is to me is that I want to help inspire and, and train and, and teach the things that I have learned to as many people as I can to help them achieve and get where they want to go with me. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. And, 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 and while doing that and, and making revenues and income and profits and everything else, I want to, I want to give as much back as I can to my community and, and people in need. It's something that I never thought I would say or do. If you asked me five years ago, do you want to donate this, that, and I said, no, I'm not doing it. What's in it for the company? Right. Right. What's in it for me? And something changed and it, it's just something you can't take it with you. Right. And if you can make a mark and you can make a difference, how little it is, it's huge because that's how legacies are made. You know, if you want to be a legacy or if you just want to be a dash on a tombstone, I'd rather be a legacy. Yeah. You know, people see the date you're born, the date you die. And there's a dash that symbolizes your life and you just get a dash. I don't want a dash when yeah. I die. So, so that's that in my personal life. Balance is all I can think of is, is that's my ambitious ambition balance. Because like you said, I work, I work, I work, I work. I'm always doing stuff. I have to learn to also balance, you know, and not always be doing something right and take those moments in life and, and enjoy them with the people I love and care about and be present, you know, doing that. Right. Pretty simple. Mine's simple on that side of it. I think that's, that's a great answer. So, well, that's all the time we've got today. Um, again, uh, we've been joined today by Chris Donzelli from Perfect Star. And uh, I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I feel like a, like a rock star here. Oh, it's awesome. Appreciate it, man. Well, thank you. All right. We'll see you next time. The True Ambition Podcast is brought to you by IT Avalon. For more information and links to other episodes, please visit www.trueambition.org. Now, go find your true ambition. And I